Well, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. We'll only go to the hour, so don't worry, we'll let, get you off in time. Um, and just to thank everybody. So this is our third video meeting of the Radiotherapy Task Force organised by the Global Coalition for Radiotherapy. And we wanted to thank all the members of the Radiotherapy Task Force for all their incredible work so far in support of Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis. We were set up, as, as you know, in response to the WHO, realising that there was a very specific area of work that needed to be done with radiotherapy and that was very different from others. And as you know, we've set up this network, particularly trying to link the whole of the community, everything from frontline staff, radiographers, dosimetrists, physicists, clinicians, patients and industry. So globally, the whole of the radiotherapy community can focus on this. And we've done the initial needs document with some really, really helpful solutions from all over the world, which, which is up on the website. As you know, we've tried to advertise the work. We've had the Lancet Oncology paper and also the very helpful interview Richard did with eCancer. And so now we're in a position to think, where now? Richard's going to tell us about the situation. And now how can we really focus and then deliver what's needed to, to help Ukraine? We've got 150 members so far of the task force and 80 are registered today. So please uh, use the chat box as I know people have started now. Please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Any questions? And remember, we'll keep all this as well. So if I don't manage to bring you in, you know, you know that we'll be answered. Um, we'll also introduce you at the end. We're going to have an updated Ukraine web web page which will be more sort of for information for people on the ground and so now we wanted today to focus our presentations on really the attention for really what might be a long drawn out issue and future planning as well and how to maintain advocacy for the patients and frontline and for radiotherapy in Ukraine. So um, we'll start now with it. We're delighted to have Richard Fesser, Sutilogen, WHO Emergency Committee member, who basically who will be able to uh, introduce for us the questions that really are what he needs to know. And here just on the slide, there are some ideas of the agenda here. So, Richard, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Pat, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Very good to see you all. Times against us, so I'm going to, if you don't mind, just dive straight in. Um, since we last talked, there's been an awful lot of work going on. Most of the WHO work has been with the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, particularly around developing the new referral guidelines and also working out the relationship of cancer within the big major WHO hubs. It's quite a complex business, um, as you can imagine, because this is an ever shifting landscape. Um, outside Ukraine, WHO really was, has been focusing on Moldova, and they've now finally delivered their system strengthening report to the Moldovan government. But to be blunt with you, that is a long-term plan. It's not something that can be used to alleviate the situation right now. Um, there are numerous ongoing surveys at the moment um, that are being run through the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Justice in, in Ukraine. And what we're trying to also work out is where cancer and palliative care is going to sit over the next six to seven months. As you'll all be very acutely aware, the conflict is now entering a, a, a quite a serious and significant new phase. And the primacy for the logistics lines, supplies and everything is all focused on combat. That's weapons and also the equipment that's necessary for the care of combat casualties. So all the other disease areas and all the other resupply lines are having to take, um, if you like, a sort of triaged place within the overall focus now, which is which is the frontline fighting and the resupply and replenishment of the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, having said all of that, the two major issues, and I think Pat's already put up the, uh, the slide on that, that we would like your help with. One is really, we constantly talk about the intelligence and operational intelligence. Um, we're still operating to a lesser and greater extent a little bit in the dark about what the trajectory is looking like across Ukraine. But also, more importantly, what are the key capacity indicators and tripwires for breaking points in the different regions, whether this is Lviv, Kharkiv, closer to the front lines, and getting a much more nuanced picture of what's happening on a month-to-month -month basis. And also, I mean, I think long term as well is, is capacity building and understanding what the long term reconstruction needs are going to be. 
the conversations that have now been having have been at the very highest level it are starting to focus around what sort of funds are going to be needed to rebuild and replenish Ukrainian health systems, but also surrounding health systems around Ukraine. And with that in mind, we've become acutely aware, of course, that it's very easy after a few months for fatigue to set in in the political arena and, and, and people for all sorts of reasons simply move on. Um, and what we need your help really here is advocacy, is how we can use your organisations to keep cancer, radiotherapy, palliative care right there, front and centre, when it comes to the top level policymakers, both the EU and international level. I'm thinking here, particularly the USA, Germany, France, UK, some of the big bilateral donors and supporters. And, and that final question is, what do you think is the key to a successful advocacy between now and the end of the year in order to keep this issue front and centre in terms of political um, heat and light? So Pat, I'm gonna, I'll stop there and back to you. Thank you very much. Hello. Richard, thank you. And please, everybody, it'd be really helpful if you've got any thoughts, answers for Richard, because I know it's a great uh, task force we've got here. Please put them in the chat or get in touch with us. Richard really needs to know this. This would be fantastic and great. And Richard, thank you so much for this and for promoting radiotherapy, of course. <laughs> um, OK, so we'll move on now. And obviously, we've had a huge amount of help so far, and hopefully we've been helpful. So uh, Dr. Ruslan Zelensky, who is head of the medical physics um, um, president of the Ukrainian Association of Medical Physicists, has been working with Alexander, who is part of the task force, um, and been looking at capacity. So really, it'd really, be really helpful if uh, Ruslan and Alexander, you can update us of the current situation, because I know it has changed quite a lot. So, Alexander, I hear you're going to talk for them. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, during the period from uh, our last presentation, uh, we together with Ruslan Zelinsky have been uh, monitoring the situation in the Ukrainian radiotherapy centers uh, and were in direct contact with which uh, of several exceptions, all radiotherapy centers are functioning in the usual mode and they provide radiotherapy treatment both to local patients and to their internally displaced persons. Uh, the exceptions, uh, according to information which is uh, available to us, are the centers in Chernigiv, uh, this is North Ukraine, and in Kramatorsk, Donetsk region. As for Chernigiv, uh, the radiotherapy is not provided due to the damage of the roof-based cooling system, which was hit by shelling, and the tomograph was also physically damaged. So this is the problematic uh, center at the moment. Uh, in Kramatorsk, uh, due to the immediate uh, vicinity to the zone of active warfare, the equipment was mothballed, uh, so it was conserved. And the doctors evacuated to Lviv uh, in Western Ukraine where they provide treatment, but the equipment is not functioning at the moment. According to the information uh, which was received by, by us, uh, the capacity of medical centers allows to treat all patients without limits. Uh, the tendency of the last weeks is the return of many people from Western Ukraine to uh, Central Ukraine. And of course, uh, movement of quite a number of people from uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region, uh, you know that Luhansk region is uh, now almost fully occupied by the Russian forces. So this uh, gives a certain load on the central Ukrainian hospitals and partially on Western Ukraine. started to return from uh, Europe post to Western Ukraine and this uh, balances uh, the people who left, uh, who returned to central Ukraine. And of course, many people returned from Europe to their homes in central Ukraine. Uh, but in general, uh, the uh, capacity allows to treat the patients, uh, though we should uh, point that in Western Ukraine, there is a lack of linear, uh, linear accelerators. Uh, during the period from our last presentation, we have specified the needs of oncological centers in materials uh, such as immobilization masks and boluses. 
uh, together with our American colleagues, Natalia Kovalchuk, who is uh, present during uh, at today's conversation, and Dr. Viktor Yakovenko, we have prepared the list of materials uh, required by the hospitals in Western and Central Ukraine and send them to the producers of these materials, namely to Orfit has donated 27 boluses, which have already arrived in Ukraine and are already on the way to the Khmelnytsky uh, Regional Anti-Tumor Center, this is Western Ukraine, and to the National, uh, the Ukrainian Association of Medical Physicists, uh, which is presided by Mr. Zelensky, has applied to uh, 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 UICC Solidarity 100 immobilization masks from Orfit for the Khmelnytsky Regional Anti-Tumor Center. Uh, so we should say that the grant was already received and we are finalizing at the moment the paperwork and logistics consideration. And we hope that the delivery will be conducted in the near future. Uh, we are also, uh, Natalia in particular is, uh, first of all, sorry, uh, is in contact with CIFCO, and we are expecting some progress with them. Maybe there will be some donation or the same schemes with grants. Also, uh, uh, Ruslan and our uh, American colleagues are working on organization of study and training uh, in the United States and in Canada. Maybe Natalia can give some uh, more uh, details on that. But the picture is generally looks like this. Alexander, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much, because I know you spent a lot of time phoning around, finding things out, and a huge amount of work. Fantastic, the UICC will be able to give you a grant uh, for the MAS, and so great, great news. But obviously quite difficult by the sounds of it, with some centres being damaged and some not enough capacity. Um, and I understand also in some areas there's some transport problems with Taxis have got very expensive because in dangerous areas. So uh, fantastic work on the ground there. So thank you for that. And I hope, Richard, that's been helpful for an up-to-date information. So if I can move now to uh, uh, Yaroslav from the IEA, who's going to give them their updates. I know they've been, you've been doing some top-level work there, haven't you, uh, in sort of uh, capacity and other issues. And people, everybody, do put in the chat any comments or questions for Alexander and Ruslan. Sorry, Yanislav, carry on. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, from IE side, um, for the last uh, two months, the major activities what we had is the completion of the dosimetry audit. In uh, collaboration actually with Ruslan Zelinsky and uh, Larissa Stadnik from Ukraine, we managed uh, to conduct uh, our regular uh, annual exercise and we successfully sent and received 24 dosimeters. Uh, it was completely new logistic. Everything was done with help of many people. And I would, really would like particularly to say thank you to Ruslan and Larissa from Ukraine who helped uh, us to organize. All dosimeters are currently in our laboratory. Uh, we're receiving also data uh, from, from the hospitals and we're ready to proceed. Uh, this year, a part of this crisis, we actually conducted this um, uh, audit one month early than planned. So thanks everyone for uh, for help and uh, collaboration. Uh, second is Dirac. As I mentioned last time, uh, we updated Dirac uh, in March, April. Uh, and after that, during the last two, two months, I think we are getting slightly more requests as usual for the data. So that was exactly on time. Uh, now we are able to provide um, data which not publicly available online. Uh, we have special uh, request form and what we are seeing right now, a little bit more requests as usual particularly to Ukraine and also globally. Um, so that is something, and if if you really need, if anyone needs uh, simply data from the RAC database, please feel free to contact me directly and I will put you in the loop or in the, in the system which we have uh, currently here at the um, agency. 
Um, we also collecting list of the equipment, um, and as Alexander said, uh, the mask and uh, for head and neck, we also have this on the list. Unfortunately, uh, we have to put everything through our, um, I would say, typical channels through the technical cooperation uh, process. And this is what we're doing right now with our Ukrainian counterparts. So all requests which we have, we have to formalize them and put in a normal um, IAEA uh, process. Um, that is all from my, um, from, uh, my side, from IAEA side. I would say all activities what we uh, what we have so far it's actually falling under our mandate and our normal activities what we do every year. Yeah, um, so that's a fantastic update and amazing that yourselves from the IEA and the people on the ground have been able to maintain all that quality and and that and also fantastic you've got all that intelligence and useful to know that there is information you have not on the website so again Richard you know a direct contact there if we've got to need some up-to-date information so thank you and thank you so much for that update okay so now we wanted to hear a little bit about uh, support outside Ukraine so uh, we've got um, Oria, who's going to tell us a little bit about Moldova to Romania um, approaches where are you Yes. I'm here. Lovely. Thank you. Have, Hi. Tell us. All right. Let me do this. Can you guys see my screen? Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thanks uh, for having me. It's really an honor to be able to present an update on our cancer program um, as part of the Blue Heron Foundation for the work we're doing in Moldova, Romania, and also parts of Ukraine. So I'm Horia Volpe. I'm a radiation oncologist. Um, used to practice in the U.S. I've relocated to Europe for at least the next couple of months to build this program. And I'm the lead of the cancer program for the Blue Heron Foundation. And our founder is Stefania Magidson. She can be here today. Uh, she's based in Beverly Hills, California. And Dr. Irina Tosino, uh, she's the medical director for the foundation and also a professor of radiology and vice chair at Yale. And she's on the call today as well. So this is our cancer care program poster. Uh, this is Olga here. She's our first patient that we've helped. And I'll talk um, a bit more about her. We have a unique phone number here that patients can access on a website as well. So a bit about the foundation, it's headquarters in LA and it's been involved in Romania and Moldova to support orphaned and abandoned youth for the last 20 years. With the war, they created 12 new programs, including medical and housing modules that are at the Siret border on the Romanian side, manned by Médecins du Monde, doctors right now, a border transport program, medicines and supply, over 85,000 sent to Ukraine and aid for displaced children, which is really their specialty um, until now. So we had a meeting with Dr. Jon Kesso from the Ministry of Health of Moldova on April 15th. And what we heard is that the Moldova Institute of Oncology registered more than 200 Ukrainian patients with cancer. Now, a lot of these patients uh, wanted to stay locally for their treatments. They didn't wanna be evacuated to Western Europe or Northern, in Northern Europe countries, mostly because of language barrier, also time commitment for cancer therapies away for their, from their support systems, from their families. And they wanted to stay close to the borders of Ukraine. A lot of them were going back and forth as well. Now, Moldova can't cover the costs of cancer therapies. They can cover emergency care, but not radiation, not surgery, not chemo. So all of that is mostly out of pocket. And they also do have limited capacity. In Romania, however, there are new cancer centers with ample capacity, uh, modern radiation equipment. They've really upgraded in the last five to 10 years. And the cost of treatments are covered. Most of them are covered. It's part of the EU. Now, the foundation had already a network in both countries because of their work with orphans and also a personal network of physicians. I'm Romanian originally, so I knew a lot of the cancer physicians in Romania. And we figure that these patients, you know, who are in Moldova may accept to be transferred to uh, Romania or to maybe to have their treatment costs covered in Moldova um, when needed. So that's when we started our cancer care program. So essentially, the way it works is patients are referred to the Institute of Oncology in Chisinau, Moldova, either by other clinics or self-referred, or also from the International Organization of Migration that has partnered with us. We do an intake. We analyze the, the file very quickly. I'll tell more about that in a second. And then if there are investigations to be done, the International Organization of Migration agreed to cover them. So that's really fantastic. And then we decide whether we transfer the patients to, um, to Romania for treatment or we uh, treat them in Moldova and we pay for their treatments uh, in country. So the way we assess them, first, we translate all the files 
and we upload them on medikai.com, which is a Romanian product. It's a web platform that's HIPAA and GDPR compliant. And all the files and the imaging can be put there. And we also give the patients the access so that if they end up somewhere else, they can have their files uh, easily accessed online. We evaluate them according to disease stage, severity. We complete investigations when needed. And then we have a multidisciplinary discussion. Sometimes we had large tumor boards, international tumor boards that some of the uh, members here actually participated in. Uh, other times we just do a very short kind of focused uh, discussion. And then we decide their suitability for treatments either in Romania or in Moldova based on their um, performance status, the capacity in Moldova or not, and also their preference. And we help with legal you know, consents and media um, consents as well. When we transfer them to Romania, we organize for transportation, cars, or ambulances. We have partners at the Department of Public Health in Romania that help us with ambulance transport. We make sure their paperwork is done for refugee status, that they have lodging, and we coordinate with receiving cancer centers and doctors in Romania. And we also help with translation services. So this is an example of the Medikai platform. This is a patient. We have a big group here of patients from Ukraine. Um, they have their files uh, and their imaging. You, know, you can easily access that from anywhere. This is the list of patients we've taken charge of so far. So we have about 31 patients so far. In blue here, we have patients that we're treating in Moldova, um, a combination of, of systemic treatment, surgery, sometimes palliative radiation as well. There are long wait lists for radiation, unfortunately, in Moldova. Uh, patients that we've transferred to Romania here, also for a variety of treatments. And then, you know, we see here in gray that we can't reach some patients or they decline treatment. So that's kind of a you know, one of the challenges that we've been seeing, you know, patients will come back and forth, they'll leave to other countries, and they'll go back to Ukraine. Um, so, so we're trying to follow up on a, as many as patients as possible. And then we have a few patients that were up for discussion um, at the bottom here. So just an example. So this is Olga, I showed uh, her picture at the beginning. She's actually 39. She was our first patient that we transferred. Um, she has six kids and she was in Odessa at the time that we took charge of her case and she was just on some, she's with cervical cancer and she was on some cisplatin chemotherapy out there just kind of waiting being bridged to some curative treatment so we arranged for her to be transferred to Cluj Romania at the Amethyst Clinic with our my colleague and friend Dr. Gabrielle Cacho who's here in green and she just finished radiation and brachytherapy I think about a week and a half ago and next to her is a Ukrainian speaking psychologist that they have at the center there so that's been really really helpful Second patient picture here is Christina. She's 25, she has Hodgkin's lymphoma. And within, I think about a week of her coming to our attention, we managed to transfer her to um, uh, the cancer center in Cluj as well to start chemotherapy. So she's already had her first cycle of chemotherapy. So we've really gotten faster. Uh, we worked on our, pro uh, on our, on our workflow um, uh, very much in the last uh, few weeks. So to finish some challenges, opportunities, communication is sometimes difficult, contacting patients, like I said, maybe they changed their numbers, they went back to Ukraine, they moved on, some have passed away. Also, we've ironed out some language and cultural barriers. We're obviously learning how to work together, different countries, different cultures, and we want to increase awareness of our program. So the IOM has been kind enough to help distribute our flyer in Moldova, and we maybe we want to put it on the OncoHelp website as well. Then collaboration, we want to increase our bonds with physicians in Moldova and Romania. These are busy physicians that are taking on additional workload. We want to continue to collaborate with Ukraine as well. So we want to understand the needs of the ground on the ground in Ukraine. We've had meetings with the Bukovina Cancer Center in Chernivtsi. We're planning a site visit there probably next week or the week after. And also emergency hospitals in Chernivtsi as well to move some of the medical modules in that area and to help them with medicines and medical supplies. Because like we heard today, a lot of them are are, are sent to the front lines and, and some of these centers are, um, are actually lacking acutely uh, in some of these supplies. We want to increase our collaborations with other NGOs. We have Hospices of Hope that are helping us, Médecins du Monde, Humans for Humans, an Israeli organization. We've had meetings with the AFPIA, Samaritan's Purse has, um, has a lot of uh, supplies as well, the IOM and Inspiration Family, which Dr. Zelensky put us in touch with, that help patients on the ground in Ukraine. We're um, working on capacity building more long-term in Moldova as well to help them with transition to IMRT. We have a head and neck ENT team going there for a mission in October in the US. They're starting to think about resident exchanges between Moldova and Romania. So we're seeing this conflict bring together Romanian and Moldova oncologists in a way that they haven't done so before. And we're also working on fundraising. So we do have a need for additional resources, both administrative and coordinators, but also for covering treatment costs in Moldova and all the transfer process to Romania and the work that we're gonna be doing in Ukraine as well and to get additional staff 
uh, for these patients. So to end, I want to, want to really say it's a big collaboration. We have had a lot of help. I really want to thank everybody involved, the cancer clinics in Romania, Amethyst, Medeuropa, Neolife, the Medicai team for the web platform, um, and Dr. Ruslan Baltaga, he's a director in Kishino, so he's been instrumental to our program and also our very hardworking co uh, coordinators on the ground. Chloe Ross is based in the U.S. Uh, Christian, uh, Christian Teglas is boots on the ground in Romania. And I say boots on the ground, he's actually a retired senior army officer, so it's been really fantastic to work with him very, very quick. And our power couple in Moldova, Dr. Artyom and Nicoleta Munzatan. And I want to say thank you to the UICC. They um, provided us a good, uh, a good amount of money with their grant. And so for donations, you can go here. And uh, thank you very much. Great. That was absolutely fantastic. And well done, the Blue Heron Foundation, straight out of the box. I see already in the chat somebody offering the, the concept of what the WHO to have added to that as well. Fantastic. I'm sorry, we're running a bit late. So please, if you've got any comments and chats to that in the chat box. But Fantastic. Great. Helping so many people. Such good coming out of that. Could I now move to, and we're a little bit behind now, Dr. Diana, Diana Gilchuk. Grishuk. Grishuk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for Hi. having me here. Let me just open my presentation. Uh, I hope you can see it. Yes. Uh, so today I would like to say a couple of words about work which I'm doing together with Amity's Radiotherapy Group and We Help Ukrainian. So at the beginning of the war, we knew we want to help as much as possible, but we had no idea how we can help. So we started to collect donations, and it was really chaotic. We were accepting almost everything and shipping it to Ukraine uh, via routes of our volunteers. So it's a big uh, collaboration of Eastern European people living here in London. Uh, so after a couple of weeks, we realized that... Also yeah, uh, so after a couple of weeks, we realized that we better concentrate on some particular items which Ukrainians really need. So we were collecting mainly things like sleeping bag and power banks, first aid kits and uh, food for children. And then talking with other donation center, we realized that the real need is about prescription medicine because people cannot donate prescription medicine. They simply cannot buy it in the pharmacy. So we decided that we will shift our focus to medicine. So how it works at the moment, we are collecting hospital detail requests and it's very important to have a proper request from the hospital what they need, what is the amount they need. Uh, very important to know if we can exchange some medicine to analog, which uh, we don't produce here in the UK, but we have something similar. We need to know about the form, is it tablets or something else? And we need to know uh, information about strengths, everything. So we need really detailed requests. Then we go to pharmaceutical companies and we get a quote from them to know the amount of money which we need for this particular request. And then we start fundraising through Amity's Radiotherapy Donation Fundraising site. So it works really well. If you uh, try to fundraise for something like general, or I would like to fundraise for medicine for Ukraine, etc., it doesn't really work. But if you put a nice picture of the hospital and say, oh, we are fundraising for this particular hospital, we need so much money and only, I don't know, 400 pounds left, please donate, then people are more willing to donate. So then we purchase the medicine and it goes to We Help Ukrainian Donation Organization. So they pack everything. And then through the, uh, our volunteers, it goes to the Ukrainian-Polish uh, uh, boundary. And then Ukrainian volunteer, they transfer it through and it goes either directly to the hospital or we are using Ukrainian railway company or um, post company Nova Pochta and it reaches different regions. So at the beginning, we were concentrating mainly on the big hospitals, but now we spread our forces a bit and uh, we are helping hospitals which are located in little small villages in the east of the Ukraine and the last hospital we help it's a little hospital in Kherson region which is really close to war boundary and uh, they basically needed everything and we managed to buy a good supply of basic medicine for them so next step, what we would like to do, we want to help more to radiotherapy centers and we would like to buy immobilization devices for them. And we're also organizing psychological support YouTube channel where we will post different uh, suggestions, uh, small videos, how people can maintain their psychological health during this challenging period. So in order to organize something similar for uh, immobilization devices, first of all, what we need, we need central database with contacts and specific requests from the radiotherapy centers. 
It's very important. I will give you an example. Last week, I was talking to my colleague from different hospital and he told me, oh, listen, we have one abandoned hospital with a big supply of immobilization mask and we are not using it more than a year. We would be really happy to donate, but we need to know, is it suitable for Ukraine, for any hospital and how we can transfer it to there? So it's very important to have this uh, information. Then we do need contacts with immobilization device sale companies because the prices are different in different EU countries and especially here in the UK. We managed to get um, agreement with pharmaceutical companies that when we purchase, we can get our VAT back because we are donating the medicine. And because of that, we, um, uh, we can buy more. And another thing is we need more shipping routes. Uh, and the most important thing, uh, you all can see that now the interest is dropping and it's getting more and more difficult to fundraise for Ukrainian projects. So we do need to improve awareness and fundraising quality. Thank you very much for your attention. Diana, thank you so much. Such a lot of good work. Hopefully there's some contacts there in the chats about those things but and we can talk afterwards, but, but, but great work indeed. Hopefully that was helpful to share. Thank you. So thank moving you. on now is uh, uh, from, we, we've invited Professor Ricardo Umberto from Estro to talk about the update on the uh, ECHO ASCO special network survey. Professor Umberto. Yes, thank you very much, Pat. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, thanks for the opportunity to have Estro, I mean, uh, today with the Global Coalition for Radiotherapy. Of, uh, my name is Umberto Ricardi. I am, was a uh, former Estro president. That's, that's the reason for my being here today. Uh, after saying that, uh, I mean, uh, very shortly, I mean, just to update you on one of the different initiatives uh, taken uh, by the ECO ASCO Spatial Network. Uh, of course, uh, all of you are certainly very well familiar on this network. Concerning this uh, specific survey, of course, uh, the aim of the survey was to gather data in terms of uh, cancer patient needs uh, and healthcare system burden in the European countries affected by the war, so neighboring countries uh, uh, across Ukraine identify and address potential gaps between the data from the ground and official sources, and of course, assess and monitor trends and impact on patient and healthcare system over time. So the radiotherapy survey was a part of an umbrella survey covering also the surgical arena and the medical oncological arena as well. And this is a, this is a short example on the different questions concerning the organization of the different radiotherapy departments in terms of infrastructures, in terms of personnel, and especially, of course, in terms of the potential capacity to deal with an extra work represented by the refugees, of course. Uh, after saying that, of course, uh, Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, of course, uh, Estro sent this survey via uh, its own uh, channels, meaning uh, I mean, uh, the National Society's uh, liaison person, because uh, as Estro, we used to work with the National Society since a long time, not only in time of war, of course, but also looking at the comments in the chat coming from Romania. Of course, uh, there was a tremendous need in terms of increasing awareness of radiotherapy in the Far East countries. And so that's the reason for which, uh, I mean, uh, uh, of course, we thought in the past to work at the European level uh, in order to increase awareness for radiotherapy at European level, but of course, being Europe, a highly heterogeneous landscape, especially in these uh, Far East countries. Next slide. Uh, here, the very few answers we got at the moment, you see just uh, six uh, answers uh, coming from one Czech Republic, two from Poland, one Romania, and one Slovakia. And just to make short a long history in terms of a very short information, uh, in 50% of cases, uh, there was uh, a potential capability in terms of uh, this extra work represented by the refugees, uh, while in the other 50% of respondents, uh, there was an impossibility to deal with this extra work. 
The concerns uh, uh, coming from the answers were mainly related to the lack of diagnostic imaging facilities, uh, not only radiotherapy, but also diagnostic imaging infrastructures was a major concern in those uh, neighboring countries. Uh, another important information concerning radiotherapy world uh, was uh, the lack of brachytherapy offer. I mean, uh, and also thinking that in the vast majority of cases, I mean, uh, being uh, women uh, only, the refugees uh, from Ukraine to the other neighboring countries, uh, breast cancer and cervical cancer were the most represented uh, cancer types. And so meaning uh, brachytherapy, lack of offer in this cervical cancer population uh, is a major issue. So uh, I guess that at the moment, uh, I don't have any, any other specific information, but of course I am more than happy in uh, I mean, looking at the chat and answering in the chat. And once again, uh, not only in this uh, time of tragic war, of course, but also as a general issue, increasing awareness for radiotherapy in this country is very, very essential. And this is part of our extra job being our statement, uh, radiation oncology, optimal health for all together. Quite obvious for all of you. Thank you. Oh, Alberto, that's that's great. And what, congratulations, Anesta, on all that good work. Is there anything specifically you'd like this art task force that they could feed back to you or help with or, or anything you can think for now? No, I, I guess that, of course, uh, also, I mean, uh, thinking at the extra statement together. Together means uh, working together. I mean, not only in this uh, tragic scenario, but also, I mean, uh, in the other issues uh, I, I mentioned before. So I guess that increasing, I mean, relationships between the different players, the different stakeholders uh, worldwide uh, is a key issue for increasing radiotherapy at the best of our possibility to all our cancer patients uh, requiring it. Yeah, no, no, I, no good, good, good point. And, 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 and actually, by the range of people we've got here, I think everybody's willing. It's a, such a good thing that's come out of all this, isn't it? And, and then actually moving on, we're, we're lucky to have the Americans here. Astro are here. You've been a great, fantastic response. And I know Jeff White's going to tell us what you've been doing. And again, how can we all help? What, what, what would help? So uh, over to you, Jeff. Thank sure. You. Thank you. And yes, I'm Jeff White with the American Society for Radiation Oncology. And I think obviously the themes that I've been hearing from the last few speakers are the need to build awareness. And you know, while we are an American-based organization, we have some platforms that can kind of um, serve as a megaphone for the needs, the specific needs that are happening in the different regions. Um, we have a very we have a vast social media network. We have 24,000 folks on Twitter, 15,000 on Facebook, 15,000 on LinkedIn. Um, we have a private member community called the RO Hub, so we are sending messages through that that goes to all of our 10,000 members, as well as uh, another vehicle is our weekly email that goes to all of our members. And we put this meeting in last week's email and we can do other activities uh, as they come up around so that all of our members can understand what the need is, but also, I, you know, one of the key things is specifically what can people do, because I think you know, people need to know like what what do you need and how can we help. So we have we certainly tried to push out the um, the Estro survey to our members <clears throat> over the last few weeks, um, as well as the data request that came from the GCR. We also have other mechanisms, including our journals. And so one of our um, main journals is called Advances. So we have created a humanitarian crisis um, collection. Uh, featuring articles written by uh, different physicians around <clears throat> the issues in, in Ukraine. We have an, an upcoming article from Dr. Kovalchek from Stanford that we'll be posting in about a week. I'll put the link to the um, collection uh, in the chat as, as I'm done here, but that's a, that's a great way for people to kind of get an understanding of what's happening or what the needs are. Dr. Kovalchek will also be doing a specific blog post about the need in Ukraine so that uh, it's laid out, it'll live you know, on our website in perpetuity, but also when there are specific calls to action, that way we can use that and augment her voice on our social media channels. And then finally, <clears throat> we will be doing a special session at the ASTRO annual meeting. It's in October in San Antonio, Texas, but on Sunday, October 23rd, there will be a special session on the situation in Ukraine 
um, as well as support efforts needed uh, of Ukrainians in the U.S. and other topics. So we will obviously be promoting that as much as we can as well. So um, that's kind of our quick update as the megaphone from Astro. <laughs> yes, but what a great megaphone. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, we're I happy to. What, what immediately springs to mind is what, what started uh, with Richard's questions right at the top now, the capacity and the advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I know people are thinking just to think of ideas, all those sub questions he's got. And I, I know we'll talk to you about that. But I think if that can be, uh, mm -hmm. as well as Astro, really to get as many ideas from everybody, absolutely something can do. And absolutely. Thank you for the Americans. I know further away, but fantastic. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, great. Now, next next thing is obviously patient groups, because we've had some uh, contact with patients and some individual contacts, and obviously like the Blue Heron individually, but we thought we might talk to some of the patient groups now and see if there's any central way, particularly in their disease sites, whether they can then uh, inform people about the radiotherapy effort as well. So I know we've got Violetta here and Kathy. So um, who would like to, Kathy, perhaps you'd like to come first. Kathy Oliver, who's of the International Brain Tumor Alliance. And I know you spoke at the uh, Chicago meeting in uh, at ASCO, which is great to see you there. So you've heard all this about radiotherapy, obviously important for brains, but in terms of that coordination of the patient groups, how are we best to help feed through that radiotherapy also on the very practicalities which center where where to get whatever far away Kathy and sorry I know you've only we only just invited you <laughs> <laughs> that was about 10, 10 minutes ago Pat but thank you I, I luckily I was free and I'm delighted to to be here and uh, a whole new world has opened up I think uh, for me being here because I I wasn't aware of all the fantastic organizations who are, are working with you, uh, you know, the Blue Heron Foundation and others are doing amazing work. And I know that uh, Violetta is also on this call and I'm sure she'll have a lot to add, but I just want to say that from the very beginning, literally the first couple of days of the war, the patient groups were right on the ground and, and filling gaps that, you know, were very gaping in terms of practicalities with, with, you know, getting patients from A to B, getting them out of Ukraine, getting them into a treatment center. And I think right now, what we need most of all is a very practical list of centers where radiation is working in Ukraine. A, a previous speaker did mention some of those, but if there was a, a central list we could go to when a patient uh, contacts us, uh, that would be tremendously helpful. All of this, as I think Richard Sullivan has said many, many times, is, is about collecting intelligence and getting that all together uh, and mapping what's out there because we are dealing directly with the patients on a case by case, family by family basis. And we need to have that information right to hand so we can refer them on to the right place. Um, I think also um, it would be useful for this information to, if it's not there already, to be on the European Cancer Organization website. If there's anything discussed today that's not on there yet, that would be tremendously helpful because we use that as a major source of information. Um, in terms of finally, in terms of awareness raising, um, yes, stories now about Ukraine are on page 85 of, of the daily newspapers, which is, is such a shame. And we need to keep the information coming to the to the press and raise awareness that way. And of course, everybody wants to hear patient stories all the time. As a former journalist, I know that that's what people are really interested in. And that is a very good hook to raise awareness. So if all of us can can keep in mind patient stories that could be publicized about challenges, I think that will help. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that, but that's what I would suggest. So. Um, that's it for me very quickly and very unprepared because, <laughs> as I said, only only found out about the meeting a short while ago. Very rude of us. But, Cathy, thank you. Absolutely fantastic. So I heard you thought it was brilliant. Just to say we have got our links on the ECHO site, for what we, the ECO site of what we've done already, like the consent form. We've got our needs assessment, which has some of the information. But as we'll just talk at the end, we're launching a, a centralised information hub for radiotherapy, which will link through as well. I think that may solve some of the problems. And you're right about media access. In terms of the plan, Richard, questions, advocacy, I think it's planting stories now in media, in New York Times, all these other things. I think we 
we really need to go for this and do some proper advocacy. So uh, brilliant. And let's work more on this together. This is fantastic. And thank you. And Violetta, I think you're there. You were, um, yeah. uh, you're based out of Romania and look after the melanoma groups. Yes, thank you. I was a bit negative because I feel that we don't have the, the right um, uh, situation in Romania. And Romania is a neighborhood country and is not receiving so many uh, patients as Poland is true, but the one that we receive um, uh, encounter, let's say, the same problem that uh, Romanian pa patients uh, face in uh, in a relationship with accessing uh, radiotherapy or uh, any other kind of uh, cancer care. Um, and um, because, okay, I understood that we focus more uh, here on the radiotherapy access, I would like just to um, uh, highlight the fact that in melanoma, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy for uh, brain metastasis is essential and is a, a procedure that is uh, uh, like uh, set, set, set up already in the guidelines, in the clinical guidelines. And in Romania, this is not accessible for free, is not reimbursed. I mean, there are some private uh, hospitals that are making efforts to reimburse it, but this is this is far not enough. And uh, uh, with related to the Ukrainian patients, we have the same uh, uh, problems in in accessing because they are asked just to 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 pay uh, money from uh, from their pocket. So uh, there is equality there, but there's equality in these disadvantages that the Romanian population, Romanian patients are, are facing. So, so the, in this respect, we are sharing the same, the same problems. Uh, of course, this is about finding uh, solutions. And um, I agree with Cathy that we should know um, how to help people in Ukraine and it will be highly useful to have to map the radiotherapy centers that are still treating patients because as we hear before many patients they don't they don't want to cross the border and the one that want to cross the border they want to come in Romania and then they they want to go back home after the treatment it's um, it's, it's done yeah, yeah. so um, we we as a patient organization we we adjust to that we develop an algorithm to to prioritize uh, the need of these patients and to have um, uh, we try with the, with the drugs in 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 Ukraine to map where where the patients can be directed, and also with the other kind of uh, treatments like radiotherapy uh, treatment for uh, for brain metastatic stereotactic mainly not interested in in uh, all brain radiotherapy in melanoma. Um, so we created we 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 mapped in Romania the centers that more or less can receive these patients gratis. Uh, uh, like like uh, reimbursed, but they are not so many. I can count them like two or three. Yeah. So it's a huge effort to to try to 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 treat these patients, and I think we should collaborate more with the national authority uh, because we are a big group here with influence. We are leaders in our <laughs> uh, yeah. areas, and um, reimbursement is a big issue. Yeah. And if it's not locally reimbursed, then. <laughs> Yeah. And patients from Ukraine will not receive it. Yeah. And patient advocacy is so important in this as well, you know, in terms of actually pushing this through. Absolutely. In terms of information, I know um, the IEA's DIRAC database uh, has got some information as well. But so that I, I think radiotherapy is some ways quite well organised, but still more to do, I think. Well, look, thank you so much for that. Thank and you so let's, much. Let's move on some of these things and more SRS. I completely agree. OK, so just completing, we're nearly um, full of our time now, but just completing the circle of the 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 the, the frontline staff and the patients and now the important thing is industry and so um, Olivia here is going to talk to us um, representing COSIA, the European uh, trade body, and also ADVAMED, the American uh, more international trade body, and tell us how um, he feels they can respond to Richard's questions. So, Oliver, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Hi, everyone. Happy to see you all. As the people that are not affected by the fatigue that Richard mentioned, but still are active uh, for Ukraine and around Ukraine, that's great. Happy to give you a quick update on industry activity um, in and around Ukraine. Um, and uh, hope you will see that there are situations that this is one when also competitors come together to achieve the best for affected patients, physicians, 
caregivers in medical infrastructure. So first question for us, the industry was, of course, what can we offer? What are our competencies? Um, and we came to conclusions. We do have a good overview on the existing medical infrastructure, on the equipment with radiotherapy devices and their qualities. We also know what supply chain issues mean for our customers and their patients. And we have experience in solving these issues. But overall, we know just as well as you that radiotherapy is not like the other cancer treatments, that we do have different requirements, that data plays a huge role uh, for both the care teams and the patients. That said, if we want to ensure that everyone in Ukraine who needs it also receives treatment, we have to work together on this, and we have. So we are supporting our customers, the hospitals, to keep their radiotherapy units up and running. We do this in the country and remote, if possible. To ensure the installed equipment can be used, we do collaborate to make sure that spare parts go where they are needed. Very important in this regards, regard, we have, we have coordinated our efforts to be more effective together uh, through the GCR, one example that helps both the radiotherapy care in general as it helps the individual patient is the patient waiver from which you already learned last session and I saw Michael in the call. And uh, it provides us with the ability to reach out for treatment data of refugees. To gather the much needed intel, we want to step further and support via GCR the work, uh, the consultancy work on the ground to monitor and coordinate needs. And you heard Alexander how valuable this is for us. All this is incredibly uh, important for the individual cancer patient in the war territories as in neighboring countries, but also for Ukraine and for the future of Ukraine. And the message is this, we believe in the future of a strong cancer care in Ukraine and we want to help moving forward with this. This is also why we as industry will proceed to advocate for international support and investments in a modern, uh, modern sustainable future radiotherapy infrastructure and appropriate workforce training for it. So thank you for your attention and all future collaboration for the Ukrainian cancer patients. Yeah. Oliver, thank you so much for that. And, and I must say from all of us, thank you for industry for being so supportive and uh, vendor neutral and really being there with us because I think this is something where we can crack it if we all work together. That's fantastic. So, okay, so we've heard a lot today and hopefully that's got different people in touch with each other, but it's thrown up a lot and particularly now how we communicate um, and things like that. So I just wanted to bring in Bar Darian now. Uh, she's the communications director of the GCR who set up this meeting and talking about our centralised information hub, which may be a help to people. So Darian, have the floor. Thank you so much, Pat. And yes, it, we have been so encouraged by everything shared today, as well as all of the information that has been shared to us um, offline as well. There has been so many emails that have come in from different members of the task force and information that we are collecting, passing on to Richard, and we really hope to pass along to everyone in this call and beyond, or all of our colleagues who are working on this effort to support Ukraine. So this is the updated centralized information hub that we're creating on our website, and it will go live after the meeting. But as you can see, we're kind of shrinking into the most important things, our needs assessment document right off at the top, um, which so many of you have contributed to. Also, as Oliver mentioned, the patient consent form, which a big thank you to the people who have supported the translations for that. Thank you to Michael Milton, as well as Diana Grishuk, who we heard from earlier. Agata Rebim, look, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong, but thank you so much for those translations. Those are available. And these are also, we're working with the EcoASCO network to make sure that these are available as well on the Onco Help site. Um, one big thing that we're hoping to do is collect all of the information, all of the work that you're doing, and this will be a part of the advocacy work. Like Jeff mentioned, that megaphone, we want to feature it and make sure that it's searchable, it's available, so that people who are looking for the data, the intel, even the articles, like Kathy mentioned, yes, the patients that are being interviewed, it can all be find, found in a centralized spot. So after the meeting, when I send, I'm the one who always sends the thousands of emails to your inbox, you'll get another one, which will have a form for you to fill out to share the work that you're doing. So I know that a lot of people have been sending me excellent PDFs of the details of what has been going on, these PowerPoint slides that have been shared today. We'll be compiling all of that so that it's searchable and um, accessible on the website website and on the web for anyone. And then of course we have some of this 
excellent data that's been provided by the IAEA, as well as um, our colleagues from the Ukrainian Association of Medical Physicists. Thank you to Ruslan for providing that. And if you want to be included as a related resource on the page, you can reach out and we would love to include your website, the information that you have on your own page as well. So this is our efforts to help with gathering the data, gathering the intel, and then making sure we're also being that megaphone within our global radiotherapy community. Thanks, Pat. I'll send it back to you. Thank you, everybody. I'm just wondering if, Richard, is there anything else you'd like to say, having heard all that now, anything else from the WHO's point of view, or do we press on with those questions you posed to us, our homework at the beginning? Thanks, Pat. No, it's extremely useful. I think, let me take the advocacy point, first of all, that Cathy was talking about. I think it would be useful to come together and have a, have a plan to utilise yeah. all the reportage, the, the, the social media power of Estro and Astro combined, and find a way of using sort of radiotherapy in the sense of Trojan horse for the whole of cancer and palliative care, because you've got very powerful networks. And also, as Cathy said, uh, you know, and what we've heard today is some very powerful patient stories, um, and particularly organisations that are working practically on the ground to disseminate and finding a way of how we can do that. And also maybe being a little bit more tactical about which countries to focus this on. So not just the usual suspects and coming up with a plan like that would be really useful. And the second bit is just picking up on, I mean, the DERA database and everything is fantastic. It's really useful. We're also very keen to understand the expected versus observed. So even if radiotherapy services are available and they're running, what sort of numbers are they actually seeing through the doors? Because we're hearing an awful lot, particularly near the front, of access and area denial work by the Russians, which is putting off patients from being able to get to centres. Um, and that could be littered ordnance, explosive ordnance, or full-scale missile attacks. So there's a real issue in intelligence here about not just the static facilities which are working, but whether or not patients are actually accessing those. And that would be really useful to understand more about that. So thanks very much indeed to everyone, Pat. No, well, no, and thank you. OK, so some good homework there. And I think if we work all together here, we'll develop an advocacy strategy and really be top drawer about that and get that intelligence observed versus expected. And I think this will be a good model for radiotherapy and cancer going forward anyway in whatever helps. So thank you for that. OK, so the chat box is there if anything more to do. But otherwise, I think I want to thank everybody a huge amount of work and um, just real tribute to the people in Ukraine and the workers there who are just, I, I don't know how you do it, and all our best wishes and let some really good come out of all this and whatever. So thanks, everybody. And we'll certainly talk again.